Thank you for attending today's Tech and Learning Future Proofing Your District Plan Conference. A special thank you to our sponsors, CatchOn, Classcraft, FileWave, Global Teletherapy, GradeCam, Sanford Programs, and thank you to all of our association partners. Today's virtual conference is focused on taking the lessons learned from current remote learning programs to creating long-term plans that support effective teaching and learning both online and in person. I wanna take this time to remind everyone to log into the conference hub using the link sent in your confirmation email. Once you are logged in, you can visit a sponsor booth to learn about their offerings and book a meeting or live chat with them. See your personalized agenda, network with over 1,000 of today's attendees, access all of the conference resources within the download section. You'll also have the opportunity to win prizes throughout the conference hub. You'll find several buttons to enter yourself in a passport to prizes. Please visit all of the pages using the navigation bar at the top of each page. Each time you find a button and fill out a form, you will earn one entry into the raffle. You can enter once for every button that you find. We will announce winners via email at the end of the conference. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions for presenters during the webinar, please submit them through the Zoom chat feature. Today's slides and additional resource materials are available and may be accessed within the downloads tab. Be sure to use the conference hashtag TLTechLive in any of your social posts. Please join me in thanking Susan Gentz, who's taken the time to speak with us today. I also want to thank each and every one of you for joining us. Please, well, please join me in welcoming our presenter, Susan. I'll let you take it from here. Hey, Susan, I think you're on mute. Sorry, I don't know <laughs> what happened there. All right, well, we'll get my screen sharing. And I hope everyone can see that. So today is supposed to be an interactive workshop. So I hope everyone in here is ready to uh, answer some questions and think through some tough issues in terms of resources that we need as we move to this remote blended setting that's coming at us in the fall. Um, and if you don't mind, if you could put in the chat, um, let's see, how familiar you are with the funds, and if your district has started a planning process, um, that will help me know where everyone kind of is as we get started. I will do an overview um, of the funds, but just kind of want to know where you are in your district. It looks like we have a little bit of a smaller group, so we can um, be really in depth here on the planning process. So if you could just write in the chat, um, I know about the funds. We've started planning. Um, no plan yet. Okay. Can help my partner schools. Okay. Um, and if you guys can click on the hyperlinked planning questions too, that'll open up a OneNote that we'll be working from today. Uh, once I go through a little bit of the overview of funds. Uh, the hyperlink is right on this, uh, the slide screen, and if you cannot click it, which I didn't think about, I will share it in the chat. Oops. Copy. Don't know why that's not copying. There we go. That should get you over to the planning document. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and just do a brief overview of some of the funds. Um, I don't know if some of you were in the primer or not, so I don't wanna go too uh, deep into it. But really there are um, four main 
areas of funding that are coming from the CARES Act for K through 12 education. Um, and I'm sure many of you have heard these numbers, but there's 13.5 billion for K-12 education in what is called the Stabilization uh, Fund, which is basically a wide open block grant that is distributed down to states and then down to districts um, through that progression. So that is the biggest fund that's available for K-12 education for specifically tools needed to go to that remote or blended setting um, due to the closures that we had this spring and also trying to help prepare for what could be more closures coming in the fall based on or due to the coronavirus. Um, there is also a governor's emergency education relief fund or gear fund. Um, there was three billion allocated and that has since been divided up amongst governors uh, in the states based on several different variables. <laughs> and then uh, we also have a micro grants fund. Uh, it just got allocated $180 million. And these act a little bit like vouchers. And I will say the stabilization in the governor's emergency fund is a uh, formula. So there's no competitive grants or anything that those are both based on Title I funding. Um, and then the micro grants are competitive and states actually have to apply for them. And the states that are likely going to win have a very heavy coronavirus burden. 40% uh, of the evaluation is based on how hard hit the state was. There's still a lot of unknowns. These are brand new grants, but essentially once a state wins them, they then can give them to districts and districts can actually give them to individual teachers or families based on what the purpose is. Uh, so these would be smaller grant, grants. They're thinking there'll be five to 15 of them and they'll probably have uh, somewhere between one to three million allocated for uh, each award. So um, the idea is that you can actually give struggling families and teachers resources. So again, these are new. If we have questions on them, I'm happy to <laughs> tell you what I know. Again, there's stuff coming out every day, so I might not know the answer, but I can tell you what I do know. Um, and then the last thing that we've seen get funding for K-12 is the student-centered student -centered funding pilot, uh, which was actually authorized under the Every Student Succeeds Act instead of the CARES Act, but it didn't get any funding until now, which is $3 million. So as you're thinking about what tools to implement for the fall, how to use the dollars, if there's um, some personalized curriculum, if there's alternate pathways, and again, we can talk through all of these. Um, this is another fund that you can now use that would not have been available even six months ago because there was no money there. Uh, so those are the four main areas of funding. Um, and then I, if you have questions on waivers or guidance, maybe that will come up more with our questions in the OneNote. Um, but does anybody have any questions before we get started? I know that was a high level overview. So if there's more details that you want, happy to provide those, but didn't want to get um, too detailed if everyone already has the background knowledge. <laughs> it's a fine, fine balance. <laughs> everyone good with that so far? Okay, so we're gonna um, go over, let's see, to the OneNote, and I will share that screen next. And we can all work off this same document, <clears throat> as long as everybody has the access that they need for that. Is everybody in? Can't log into the planning doc. Uh oh. Where is the share? 
Well, at the worst here, I can at least copy and paste the questions into the chat. And that should go. And then you guys can have like your own district team doc too, which was originally my plan, <laughs> but technology. Um, and so I don't know, um, Navi, if is it only participants can um, can do the chat or can we actually unmute everyone? Can you remind uh, me? I'm checking that right. Okay. <laughs> Let me see. Participants, attendees. I feel like it could be a little more interactive if we can all talk. <laughs> but if we do it through the chat, then that's how we do it. Hold on, I'm, I'm giving everyone access to talk. So they will have to unmute. Hold on, bear with me one second. All right, so I just gave everyone access to speak. Um, I know Annie has unmuted, um, if the Patrick, Thea Patrick as well, but if everyone can just unmute, you'll have um, access to your voices. Yay, thank you. No <laughs> um, and actually, this is better. So if you, if everyone wouldn't mind telling me, um, if you want to tell me your name and your district and uh, if the process has started, I think that'd be a really great place for us to start with the conversation. Um, and I did think about just putting it in a Google Doc. However, uh, K20 Connect uses Outlook and it just seemed like a better idea to <laughs> do the OneNote. So um, I'm happy to take notes as we talk if that's helpful as well. So I can do the typing if you guys want to talk to me about some of these questions or ask additional questions. So if we could do a few intros, that would be really helpful. Um, I'll start. Okay. You, um, I guess my, oh good, you can't see me. Um, <laughs> my name's Sue Ann Graham. Um, I really don't know a whole lot about this. I work in uh, Marion University, Indianapolis, and work with partner schools. So I'm just trying to learn more about what's going on. So I don't know how helpful I'll be, but mm -hmm. I'm just here to learn what I can. Sure. Great. Thank you. Is everyone shy today? <laughs> I can introduce myself too. Oh, perfect. Yeah, so my name is Esrael Shafi. I'm an academic strategist with uh, Company Tech, but we work, or I partner directly, and we partner directly with New York City Department of Education schools. A lot of the work that I do with those schools is help them find funding and dig into that funding and connect them to those resources. And I know with everything happening with the CARES Act, it's a lot of information to digest and it seems to keep on changing and new things are added. So this is really helpful just to attend this um, virtual meeting with you to learn more. And especially I like how you have this thinking through budgets and income funds and flexibilities, I think would be really helpful to our school partners as they navigate through this and digest all this information. Sure. but no planning yet. Sure. Just need the help. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, well, and I imagine that's where a lot of districts are. I just want to make sure that I'm not making too many assumptions is <laughs> basically. <laughs> oh, thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Should I call on people? <laughs> uh, do Michael Martin, do you have sound? No. Okay. Um, well, please feel free to type, but if there's not a lot of people who have actually started the planning process, then maybe I will do a little bit more background on 
the funds themselves, if that's helpful to those who um, are in here currently trying to help school partners, especially it sounds like um, both of those are <laughs> at least represented. So uh, I actually, uh, I'm so sorry, Navi, I'm gonna switch <laughs> uh, back to my other PowerPoint, if that's okay. <clears throat> We're doing this uh, personalized style where we're going to meet each other where we are in our learning um, <laughs> is what we're doing, right? Let's see here. So here's our primer. <clears throat> okay, now I'm going to your screen. Primer. Okay, so we talked a little bit about where these funds are. Um, and then I wanted to also talk about actually applying for the CARES fund because this is way different than any funds that you apply for within the Every Student Succeeds Act where there's a lot of regulatory burdens, there's a lot of assurances required and very specific instructions, even if they're formula grants that you still have to provide to your SEA and then ultimately to USDE. So the uh, ESSER application is very simple. Um, it's actually even only called a certification and agreement. It's not even called an application. And the idea behind this streamlined uh, application process was to get the funds out quickly. Um, and so as you can see, there's very few things that are required for it. And what's even more interesting is when you look into this application process, what the state education department requires the uh, districts to provide is even more vague. <laughs> so uh, it will be like an SEA may require an LEA to provide an assurance for X, Y, and Z. The SEA may allow an LEA or may require an LEA. So there's a lot of flexibility and um, again, the idea was just get the funds out fast. So on one hand, it's a little scary because there aren't a ton of accountability requirements in the law. And the hope is that we take these funds and we're thoughtful and we use them well and holistically, which sometimes when things are rushed gets lost a little bit in it. But on the flip side, districts can use these quickly. And in my state, um, I'm in Iowa, in my state, uh, districts are even allowed to retroactively use the funds. So if they bought hotspots or they bought devices or they bought an uh, LMS or curriculum or, or just any online tool that they didn't have, they can actually retroactively use funds to cover it um, back through like mid-March. So um, every state might be different on that and I'm happy to uh, look up what states are doing if you have a specific one that's not Iowa, but um, there's a lot of opportunities with this application where you could say, well, we actually already spent this money <laughs> and this is what it was spent on. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that you can do with that too. But again, the process, super streamlined and super simple. And I have a Q and A here. I'm gonna try to answer questions. Um, as I go, since I wanted this, I want this to be interactive and not just me talking at you. <laughs> um, so we have the question, is this funding coming from the CARES Act funding buckets? Which one is this? Yes, uh, the, uh, this is called the Stabilization Fund for um, ESSER is the uh, acronym that's used. So that's the bucket that ESSER is. There's another bucket called the GEAR Fund, which is the Governor's Fund. And then we have those micro grants and then we have a student centered funding pilot and each of those application processes looks different. Um, but the one that has the bulk of the money going to K 12 is this ESSER fund with this ESSER application. Um, so along with the funding, there's a ton of flexibility. Um, so Okay, there we go. And these are just as important as the funds. I mean, obviously we need funding to purchase things to get resources to our students, 
but the flexibility is really thinking about the future. So this first waiver that came out from USD, well, before this even, there's a waiver from all end of year assessments. Every state applied for it, every state got it. So just so you know that no state is required to um, administer or report data on those end of the year assessments. But then after that uh, came this idea that we would waive the 15% carryover limitation for Title I Part A. This is huge. A lot of districts have anywhere from 50 to 70% of their budget left when schools shut down. That's a lot of money to carry over that uh, in normal circumstances, you would only get to keep 15% of. Instead, you can keep it all. You don't have to give it back to the state. And what's interesting about the carryover is these funds would actually have to be given back to the state in a year. Um, where the stimulus funds are good through September 2022 before you have to give any back. And so there's been kind of this frantic, I need to spend all of my stimulus dollars, I need to get them spent really fast, and that's not true. Uh, so take the time, be thoughtful, plan it out, and I would actually encourage you to figure out how to spend your carryover first and then stimulus funds or at the very least, how you bundle your carryover with stimulus to create a bigger pot um, and then you know, have better buys, better options, that kind of thing. So um, when you're working with school partners especially, I would look into how much carryover they have because we know state budgets are gonna fall short next year and beyond. Um, and so as the states are <laughs> maybe coming back telling you to cut X percent off your budget, 20 percent, whatever it could look like, um, your carryover could be a little bit of a supplement for that hit that's coming. Uh, so I would strongly urge to think through carryover at the very least with stimulus, um, if not before stimulus, depending on what the needs are. Uh, so that is a huge waiver in terms of where district can, districts have funding that they wouldn't normally have that they would have to return back to the state. Um, are there any questions on carryover? Everyone good on that? Okay. Um, and then we also have uh, availability of prior fiscal year funds for Title I, II, III, uh, four and five. So uh, it's not just Title I, but the 15% and, you know, so much of a district budget comes from Title I. That's really where the biggest impact is. But um, you also can keep your other funds too, which I know like for Title IV Part A, a lot of districts got the minimum $10,000. So <laughs> most likely that's already spent. Um, so this is really just wherever you have funds left, you can keep um, from the prior fiscal years through this next one to help offset some of the hits that are going to be happening. Maybe it's because I'm not in slideshow view that's not working. Is that what's happening? There we go. Okay, so another really important title in terms of going remote, going blended, getting students online is Title IV Part A which I usually just refer to as the technology dollars that are within the federal law. Um, it's a little bit misleading because there's other uses for it too, but um, essentially Title IV Part A, if you received $30,000 or more in your district, you would have to do a needs assessment. That is waived. Um, any funding that you have in Title IV-A at this time or whatever is coming in the next fiscal year, which the federal fiscal calendar starts over on, um, in October. So anything that you have left, um, you don't need to do a needs assessment for that. That's completely waived. And another, um, the next two relate also to Title IV Part A because there were some spending requirements. So ESSA says that in Title IV-A, you would have to spend 20% on a well-rounded education, 20% on safe and healthy schools, and then it would have a 15% cap on devices. Um, and then anything else can kind of flow between. So that's waived. 
So if your district or your district partners needed um, to buy devices for you know, how 300 kids or whatever, um, depending on how much you get and what percentage that is, uh, you can do that. Where before maybe that would have been 20%, so you couldn't have gotten that done. So um, you can use those dollars however you best need to, uh, to basically help get through this transition. And then um, that's where those two go together. One is the, the percentages on safe and healthy and well-rounded, and then the cap on uh, technology and infrastructure. And then this last one is also really helpful. Um, and there's a waiver to, uh, to the definition of professional development. So before, maybe your district had to do an RFP if they wanted to bring a professional development consultant in, or they had to have an already existing contract with a vendor, or whatever that process looked like, it's now waived. So if you're doing a whole new system or anything, you, you can just bring those professional development folks in so that your educators can get operating up and running as quickly as possible. <clears throat> uh, so this is carryover, we definitely talked about that. Again, look for all the ways that you can bundle these funds. Um, and then we have, I just, if you have any questions, there's so many other things that are in the works that aren't even education specific, but still could be applied. Uh, so for instance, with special education supports, uh, telemedicine is a way that has a regulatory flexibility now that before coronavirus we didn't have. So uh, before doctors could not bill or charge for a phone call consultation or video conference consultation, and that has now been changed. So if your district, you know, if you have a special ed student who has to do their therapies online or has something like that, uh, that's now allowed for providers to charge for that. And so they're offering that as a service. So again, it's not a direct fund, but rather a flexibility from regulations um, that really allow students to have access to new online tools um, that are supporting them well, even if they can't go into the brick and mortar setting. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of things like that too. There's, there's money for mental health. Um, as you know, we've seen a rise in, you know, suicides, we've seen a rise in domestic abuse. There's other ways that um, you can find funding that's not specifically K-12, but that is actually um, still really helpful. Um, okay, curious on your thoughts of any future funding for schools or anything you've heard being discussed that is in the works. So I'm assuming this is um, the HEROES Act, maybe what the House just passed. Um, there are, and if it's not, let me know. I can talk to any, or, or even state budget shortfalls, we could go down that road too. Um, but the HEROES Act did pass the House, and I heard that in, at first it was early June, we could pass a phase four of future funding. Um, now it's late June, <laughs> so we'll see if that keeps getting pushed back. But I will say, um, I've got some numbers here from some advocacy work that um, the uh, uh, 62 superintendents signed on to a letter and they were urging for 175 billion for the educational stabilization funds. So that would be the one that got 13.5 billion, uh, the first passage of the CARES Act. Uh, they're asking for 13 billion for IDEA, 12 billion in additional for just Title I programming alone, uh, and then additional 2 billion for E-rate. Uh, so what's interesting about this number is that actually when the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or ARA, that was the last stimulus under President Obama, when it passed, it's about the same amount as that act was. Um, so there's, that would be an additional 58 billion going to K-12 public schools. And then they're asking essentially for the same for higher education as well. Um, the bill is likely not to pass with those numbers. <laughs> um, and even the house bill doesn't have those levels of numbers proposed in it either. Um, 
but it might not pass as a whole package like the CARES Act did, but I will tell you that the House, the Senate, and the White House, uh, connectivity is a priority for all three of those. And so even if they don't pass like a whole package, they could still pass an E-rate bill. They could still pass, you know, money specifically for broadband. Um, so it could get sliced and diced more than the whole package, which, you know, when the CARES Act passed, we were all not really sure what this meant, right? <laughs> like we didn't know how serious it was going to be. We didn't know uh, how long schools would be closed. Like at the time, some were like, oh, we're just closing for two weeks. And it took a little while for us to finally all call it off for the rest of the semester. So uh, there's... I think there will be more funding. And another thing that I've heard is the Senate is really waiting to see what we do with this first round of funds. So if we can be thoughtful, if we can make holistic approaches, if we can really use these funds to bring students where they need to be and provide these personalized learning pathways that we've all been talking about for so long, if we start to show success in that, then the Senate would be more likely to allocate more. So it is on us to use the dollars well, to think through what that looks like, um, and, then, and then see what we could get from there. If we have, nothing moves a policymaker more than data. So if we have data on how this is improving lives, how this is um, going to help us when we come back in the fall, what this means for assessments, everything like that, they're going to be more inclined to give more funds to keep expanding and scaling what we're doing. Um, so a long winded way to um, say <laughs> that there could be funding, but I don't know when it will be or what it will look like, <laughs> which is the nature of the Senate and many topics of DC happy hours <laughs> to discuss that. Um, and, and in terms of the state budget shortfalls, it's gonna look really interesting too. Part of it depends on where the state was before coronavirus hit. Again, in my state of Iowa, we had a surplus on hand. Like we're certainly not going to have that now, but the impact of what actually gets to the districts is going to look different. Then you have the var the variables of how much state, what percentage of state budget uh, actually goes to education. So like in Vermont, 90% of their state budget goes to education. In Iowa, it's about a third. And then somewhere in the middle, most states, it's about 50% of the budget. So it really depends on how much of your current infrastructure depends on that state budget to see what that looks like too. Um, but it'll be, you know, in states like Alaska, where oil is their main backbone of their state economy, and, you know, we all saw how low prices got, they're going to take a huge hit there. Hawaii will take a hit on tourism. New York will take a hit. I'm Everyone, I mean, even in Iowa, we had to close down a bunch of our meatpacking plants. So, like, all of, every state has an industry <laughs> that for sure was impacted by coronavirus. So, that will look different. Um, all across the board. Um, so I don't know if it's, oh, that's okay, let's see. Since many of the funding buckets goes through the state or governor, for a district to tap into some of this funding, they would have to apply to the ESSER fund or complete the application to start gaining some of this. So the state completes the ESSER fund application. And then once the state gets their funds, which they should have by now, um, then it will, um, after the state has it, each state can keep up to 10% for their own initiatives if they wanna do that. And then they can allocate down to the districts. And so your state might have like a five question thing, what are you gonna do with these? Kind of a little bit of assurances. Um, and that's the only application. It's not like we're not going to give them to you. It's just a, um, we need to be able to show USDE what our districts are doing with it. So it's more assurances and um, 
it, it really is to help you plan. What are you going to do with them before we give you this money? So that's how that is uh, taken care of. So let's see, I'm trying to find my clock here. We have about 10 minutes. So what I can do is we can go over to this document um, and I will figure out how to make sure that's shareable through the hyperlink. So if you do go back with your district or district partners that you can um, take these questions with you when you do that. And again, if you have questions after this, you start planning, you're like, wait, what's, what's the best way to do this? Um, happy to talk with you later. My contact information is on the slides as well. Um, but a lot of these are really trying to get districts to be like, what are we doing in the fall? Uh, I was talking with a district leader a couple weeks ago and she was like, we can't get past drive by graduation right now. Like that's the only, that's as far as our district can think. And so the idea is to really take this document back and say, okay, we're in the summer now. We really need to figure out what fall is gonna look like. And we have to assume that there's gonna be at the very least rolling closures uh, to see what that looks like. <laughs> so um, I, I hope that this is a helpful planning document for you. And if you had any questions, um, wanted to let you know that you can reach out at any time. I see something in the chat here. I don't know where my chat is. Where that went. Hmm. Is that, am I not in Zoom? I think I am. Let's see. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second and see if I can get the chat up. Oh, it was right there. Okay, there we go. Oh, yes, thank you for sharing my information. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, so anyway, are there any questions or anything on these types of questions or even things that you've already had asked from your, dif your district partners or anything else I can help um, help you understand? through all of this craziness. <laughs> I think it would be really interesting for those of you working with several districts to ask about the micro grants. I haven't seen any states that have said, yes, we're applying for them. And so that could be uh, maybe even less competitive. I don't know if it's because they don't really know about them or know how they work. Uh, but I think that would be a good question to ask if that's something that they were planning on doing. Um, I also would make sure that you're bringing up special education with them. There are no SPED waivers from the USDE, so FAPE is still there. Uh, you still need to make sure that you're offering all the same services as the general ed population. Uh, so making sure that they're thinking through that, what tools they need to ensure those meetings are happening, those evaluations are happening. Um, the professional development piece is huge. Again, we can waive that definition. So how do we streamline that for educators? How do we personalize professional development when we're remote? Those kinds of questions. Um, and again, that bundling with carryover with all of the funds. Um, and then and then making sure you know if you can retroactively pay for some of those purchases already made. Um, so those were those are the um, main, I would say beginning questions to think about. They're obviously very high level, allowing you to go more in depth on the actual implementation, but at least to get thinking about, these questions based on the information coming from the federal level. Um, and again, I'll make sure that everyone has access to that. So I believe that is um, most of the information for me. If anyone have any other thoughts or questions, 
or at least it seems less overwhelming now <laughs> kind of feedback. <laughs> Oh, sure, no problem. It's it's really hard to know. I mean, um, I know someone mentioned it, it changes every day and that for me is called job security. <laughs> so uh, that's good, but it also I know is really challenging and overwhelming and policy gets really nuanced really fast. And so it's good to have background on these types of things, so. And, and in the federal policy land, uh, process is just as important as the policy. And so understanding, okay, we got this one through, now what's the likelihood of another one getting through? Those questions can also be really helpful to talk about. <laughs> Great. Okay, well, we can end, I think we're just like four minutes early here. so. Thank you so much for coming. And again, if you go back to your partners and you have more questions, um, happy to to talk about this with you too um, once you get started on that. So I think that's it for me. I will hand it back over to Navi. Mm -mm. All right, on behalf of the entire team, thank you for attending today's Tech and Learning Future Proofing Your Future Proofing District Plan Conference. That was a tongue twister. <laughs> Special thank you to our sponsors, Catch On, Classcraft, FileWave, Global Teletherapy, GradeCam, Sanford Programs. Thank you to all of our association partners. Um, stay tuned. Um, Susan will be conducting another um, segment titled Stimulus Primer. That will begin at 12 p.m. Eastern. Um, look forward to seeing you guys in a few minutes. See you soon.